and thank you very much for joining us on our last day of interactive and, and engaging events. We're thrilled to have you joining us. Um, at Farrah's, one of our focuses is acting for private business, family businesses, entrepreneurs and investors. And this week is therefore a key part of our year. If you haven't done so already, please do take a look at uh, entrepreneursweek.co.uk to see a little bit more about how we work with entrepreneurs and investors throughout the year. Um, please do feel free to join the conversation about the week on social media. You can do so using the eWeek2020 hashtag and tagging um, at Farr and Co on LinkedIn, Twitter and Instagram. If you haven't already, please also don't miss out on our final session of the week, which is an hour of cocktails and networking with some fantastic prizes available donated by some of our clients. Just a couple of quick housekeeping points before we get started. Please do keep yourselves on mute just to prevent any audio feedback or disruption. There will be an opportunity for questions and please do feel free just to um, tap any questions you have into the chat box um, and we will look at these at the end. Um, also to let you know that the session will be recorded so that it can be shared with our clients and a recording of all the sessions this week and a summary of key takeaways will be available on our dedicated microsite, entrepreneursweek.co.uk. And we're here to help. So if after the session you've got any questions, please do get in touch. And full contact details are again on our microsite. So this session is a masterclass on establishing a corporate foundation. Um, I'm just going to look in fairly sort of high level detail, some of those initial considerations for business in thinking about setting up a corporate foundation. Today, we're just going to talk about what a corporate foundation typically is, the advantages and drawbacks of setting one up, some alternatives um, that I would always encourage a business to consider when it's going through that process of evaluating whether a corporate foundation is going to be the right option for it. And then I'm going to run through the stages that and the decision making to go through in setting up a corporate foundation, how you go about it, what you need to think about and what tend to be some of the bigger hurdles to overcome when planning to um, to get a corporate foundation up and running. Um, and then just those basic steps as you go through that initial setup. Um, this probably all sounds fairly obvious, but what, just what is a corporate foundation? Essentially, it is a charity that is linked to a business somehow. The way in which it's linked can vary, but it's a way for that business to engage in corporate giving or support corporate giving through a foundation that will typically um, bear a similar name to it and may be identified as you know, a you know, name of the business foundation. For businesses in England and Wales, it will usually be registered by our Charity Commission here, although if you are in Scotland or Northern Ireland, charity law is devolved and there are separate charity regulators in those jurisdictions. The common characteristics, and I think each of these are quite important points, is that a foundation is an, indep is an independent um, entity. Um, it, will, it will usually be a legal entity. It's, it's independent of the business. It is not a part of the business. It isn't within the business. It is outside of it, albeit it might bear the business's name. Um, it will be focused on achieving particular purposes that will be set out in its constitution. And corporate foundations tend to be funded predominantly by the company that established it and often face some challenges in getting funding and from networks that go beyond those networks of the business. Um, but beyond that, corporate foundations can vary very significantly in what they do and how they achieve their ambitions. So just a little bit of context and you know, what the landscape looks like for corporate foundations. Um, uh, the last time anybody counted, there are at least 140 corporate foundations in the UK. That number is growing as more companies seek to leverage the reputational benefits, but I think also as the expectations on businesses to, um, to, to really deliver social value as well as profit 
increases in the expectations of employees and stakeholders and shareholders um, it expects businesses to um, to have values that go beyond um, that drive to to run a successful and um, a financially successful business um, and over the past few years we've seen grant funding by the top 50 corporate foundations increase by 35 um, percent I must admit over the last few months I had anticipated that the pandemic would perhaps deter businesses from pursuing corporate foundations or put those plans on hold uh, but actually I've continued to have quite a few conversations with businesses wanting to set up corporate foundations or interested in the role a charitable structure can have with, within, the, within the broader structure of their business. There are some really large corporate foundations in the UK with grant budgets um, around 20 to 30 million. The Lloyds Foundation is a very well-known funder and, and one on which lots of community groups and, and smaller charities um, have had an, had an awful lot of funding. Um, but corporate, you, you see much smaller corporate foundations too, um, and they can be very successful on a smaller scale. Um, and a number have been established by small, medium-sized enterprises and operate in local communities. Or um, I can also think of one I act for that focuses on a very specialist area of funding and is the best known funder for that, for that particular specialism that, that it has honed in on as being um, you know, what it what it wanted to achieve as a charity. There's just a few little examples of corporate foundations, and these foundations um, are somewhat picked out of a hat. But they they vary between those that carry out their charitable activity through giving to other charities and community groups, um, and those that will run operational projects and and carry out charitable programs within the foundation itself. Obviously, that tends to require some greater infrastructure, some greater planning, sometimes staff. Um, but, but there is a real variety of what corporate foundations choose to do out there. And, and I really just wanted to illustrate that. So why, why do we see businesses consider that a corporate foundation is something that they want to do? Um, so, of course, I mean, you will be aware that companies are being challenged increasingly to share and apply the expertise they have to tackle social issues, to define their role in society and, and, to, uh, and to tell people what their values are as a business. Um, and, and of course, there is um, lots of businesses are challenging themselves on the envir environmental impact they are having. And a corporate foundation can be one way in which some of those environmental impacts can be addressed or work can be supported to um, in conservation or sustainability. So what can a corporate foundation do? It, it, it can be a very successful vehicle for a business to engage with the voluntary sector it's by no means the only way, but it can be a way of demonstrating externally that commitment that you have as a business to corporate social responsibility. It, it, it can be a means of projecting the values of a company through the support that it provides to its foundation for valuable um, charitable work and valuable projects. And it is a structure that is set up and ready to go for charitable giving from the business. And so rather than um, what you sometimes see is, is, is that you know, businesses are thinking towards the end of the year they've got a pot of money that they want to use to give to charity and you know, there can be difficult choices to make as to which is the right project to support or the programme. Having a corporate foundation set up is you, know, you have that structure ready to receive gifts without there needing to then be a decision um, as to who ultimately may decide. Of course where you do have a foundation it, it will then be um, the foundation that is allocating those funds rather than the business um, but I'll come on and, and say a little bit more about that later on in the talk. Um, I think it is also a very simple way for businesses to, um, to, to measure what they are what, what they're doing for charity what they're giving to charity 
the corporate foundation will have its own accounts which will be filed with the charity commission which will show very clearly what you're doing for charity whereas um, otherwise of course you can measure what you give to charity but it, but it can be sort of harder to pull that together than where you do have a, a corporate foundation set up and ready to go I mean, in my experience, most businesses choose to set up a corporate foundation not because they want reputational benefits or um, it, it's generally because the business sees it as a good thing to do and something that they, they're really committed to doing and they have a real passion for having their own foundation that is then able to go out and, uh, and create a real impact. No doubt, there are re there can be reputational benefits for the company from having a uh, having a foundation, and it can demonstrate the business's commitment to um, to charity and 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 to creating social value as as well as generating profit. Um, I, I think it can create a sense of common purpose and culture within the company, uh, and it, it, it's. There is some ability when a company gives to its corporate foundation for it to provide that funding on terms requiring the foundation to apply it for particular purposes um, or, or in a particular way so it, it isn't you know you don't have to hand over the money to the foundation and allow it to do whatever it wants there is still a way in which the, the business is able to steer the funding of the foundation in a particular direction um, and beyond just funding, there are opportunities to leverage in-kind support um, that a company can provide through volunteering, through expert advice to, to charities. And uh, businesses sometimes find that uh, where you have a corporate foundation, it, it will find it easier to engage with charities than where the business does so, so directly. But you know, that, that won't universally be true and plenty of charities will be very happy to deal with businesses direct as well. Um, when I talk to people about setting up corporate foundations, I always spend a good 10, 15 minutes really testing whether, the corp, uh, you know, whether they need a corporate foundation to achieve what the business wishes to achieve and what alternatives there might be that can be pursued. Because no doubt there are drawbacks and there are real downsides to think about and risks. And I think it's important to think about the risks and the costs against those benefits just, just to test um whether the business is going to get the benefits that are going to be needed given given the risks and the costs involved um the registering a corporate foundation with the charity commission tends to be quite an involved process the commission will have lots of questions they will want to know how the business and the charity will work alongside each other they will want to know whether the, whether the business is going to get benefits from from the foundation and so there can be some quite a lot of costs both in terms of time but also in terms of external advice that might be needed to get that foundation set up in the right way um, but I, I, I do think it is very um, it is very important to have that foundation set up in the right way and to have that relationship between the foundation and the charity and the business um, set up in a way that protects the business um, as, as well as ensuring the foundation can operate in accordance with the expectations of um, the, the charity commission. There will be ongoing operational costs. Charities are highly regulated and the charity commission has very extensive regulatory powers it can bring to bear on charities. Um, there is a need for constant vigilance around possible conflicts of interest between the foundation and the business um, and just as a very sort of simple guide there tends to be much greater sensitivity of, towards conflicts of interest and higher expectations of the commission in managing conflicts than you, you will see in a commercial setting um, and there is the potential for things to go wrong quite often we're asked to advise where the business feels the foundation is going in the wrong direction or you know there has been um, some dispute between the foundation and the, and the business and so a tension can can crop up um, there can be ethical clashes 
reputational issues and those issues are not always simple to resolve and and, and they don't always have an answer to them either um, some years ago i i have helped two businesses close down their corporate foundations because their corporate foundations had um uh, you know ha had stopped being aligned to the business to such a degree that they, the business has decided they no longer wish to support their foundation, which is you know, very sad to see. And it's, it's very distracting and, and, and time consuming for the business to deal with. Um, so I was trying to think through some of the alternatives. Um, if you're feeling sort of unsure whether a corporate foundation is something that is going to be um, the right thing for your business, there are all sorts of other ways that the charitable sector loves engaging with businesses and working with businesses, not just um, fundraising, but also programs where the business works alongside um, the charity or, or, or the voluntary program. So uh, th there are lots of alternatives that, that there might be a way in that might be something that the business chooses to do for a few years before deciding that actually it, they, they would rather have their own foundation. So you see lots of businesses that have um, connections to particular charities which, will, which might be publicised. Um, there are a number of um, donor advised funds out there, which are funds that are established as charities and they will they will operate much in the same way as a corporate foundation, but without that same separate identity and without the need for the business to take on that reputational risk. But they will allow a business to pay into a pot and then uh, effectively tell um, tell the fund how you would like that pot distributed to two different charities. You can establish funds with community foundations. You might set up employee fundraising schemes or payroll giving. Um, you, you might come together with customers to collect money for a particular purpose or some match funding program. So there's, there's pl plenty of ways you can give money without a corporate foundation. You can of course give time or resources um, to, to, to charities. And there's quite a number of, of, of charities out there set up to help businesses um, volunteer to help them um, pr provide voluntary input for charities. You can, there's a growing social investment market in the UK and lots of businesses and lots of entrepreneurs can be particularly interested in social investment and that, that entrepreneurial spirit within the voluntary sector. Um, there are a number of, of organizations set up to support social investors and to promote it. It's always worth thinking a little bit about the tax aspects because it, it's slightly different to charitable giving, um, but there are plenty of programs out there um, that will support businesses wanting to consider social investment. And of course, if you set up a foundation, it can carry out social investment. It can make loans as alternatives to, to, to doing grants as well. So it, it isn't one or the other. But there are ways in which you can engage with social investment without setting up your own foundation. And of course, there's that, you know, that there are various other ways that businesses might choose to engage with charities and community groups. So just to talk through some of those initial considerations to establishing a corporate foundation. There is a piece of work that I would always suggest that businesses do fairly early on just to think about the structure of that foundation um, and to think about the likely costs of setup and the ongoing costs um, both in terms of the time commitment from the business um, but also the, um, the financial costs of dealing with the, uh, with, with the administration. And I think also at that early stage, it's helpful to think about what the foundation will do and the extent of the foundation's work, because once you've mapped that out, that will help you analyze whether there are 
good alternatives out there for you or whether actually a corporate foundation is going to be the, the only option really for you if that's what you want to achieve as a business. Um, now, identifying and, and working out that right relationship between the business and the foundation is always one of the most important and, and, and tricky things to do. Um, and I'm going to talk about each of these bullet points in a little more detail. So just thinking about branding issues um, and this alignment of the brand or, or not, um, most foundations will be the you know, name of business foundation and that is fairly common but that brings with it, it, it brings with it the advantage for the business of there being a reputational upside where the foundation is doing good work but it also brings with it a degree of risk because the foundation is independent and separate from the business but yet you have the foundation carrying the business's name and so from a business perspective I think it's always very important to think about how your brand your business brand is being protected through um, if, if you're allowing the foundation to use it it's also quite important to um, to note that the expectations of the charity commission will be slightly different where the foundation carries with it the business's name um, because the commission will then be more alert and more concerned about what private benefits might flow to the business um, and so they will also be concerned about how it is clear that the foundation is separate from the business. So there's quite a lot to think about with branding, but I think from the business perspective, what you really want to make sure you get right is that the business's ownership of that brand and right to use the brand is protected. Um, and I'd also suggest that, that you know, there is an agreement that should the foundation part ways with the business at any point in the future, there are, you know, there is a contractual right to require the foundation to change its name. So the second one, talking about ensuring and maintaining the independence of the foundation from the business. Now this concept of independence is always quite tricky because we're not talking about the foundation being, you know, doing whatever it likes over here and being completely unconnected to the business. When people talk about the independence of charities, what we're getting at is that independence in the decision making of trustees and, and the factors that trustees are weighing in their mind when they're taking decisions. It doesn't mean that trustees can take any decision they like. Trustees will be bound by contractual agreements they've entered into. They'll be bound by the law. They'll, they'll, they'll be there'll be a number of factors that will limit that decision making. But when they take that decision, what they'll be weighing up and, and that the overriding, um, their overriding duty is to consider what the interests are and what, what is the best way of furthering the charity's purposes. And so every decision they take whether to enter into a funding agreement with the business on particular terms, whether to enter into that IP license, restricting their use of the name, they will need to be thinking only about those that the charitable mission of the foundation. And what they won't be allowed to do is think about, well, what, what the business would like us to do. In their decision making, what the business would like will be an irrelevant factor that they're not allowed to take into account. And so that, that, that's really what we're getting at in independence. It is about thinking about what factors and, and how trustees will approach the decision making um, on the part of the foundation. So coming on to conflicts of interest and or loyalty, conflicts of in, in, interest is an area I think that probably creates the most amount of work for the Charity Commission in terms of their regulatory engagement with charities. The Charity Commission is very sensitive to, to, any, um, to any conflicts of interest or loyalty. When we talk about conflicts of loyalty, what we mean is where a trustee of the foundation may have a duty of loyalty to another organisation. So typically how it manifests itself for corporate foundations is that the trustees of the foundation will include 
um, a number of people who also work within the business or perhaps are directors or shareholders and they will be seen as having a conflict of loyalty where they sit as trustees of the foundation and so what you will tend to need as well as trustees that are connected to the business is a number of independent trustees who can then take unconflicted decisions when the foundation is entering into any agreement um, with the business. And uh, if you set up a corporate foundation, the commission liked to see a majority of trustees being independent, um, but they will, you know, they, they will often accept a lower number, but they will expect that a foundation is able to take a core decision, so a, a valid decision, so, um, with, and that core might be two or three, um, where those trustees have, n have no conflict at all. And so it, w when you set up a foundation, quite often the thing that can take a bit of time is identifying those trustees um, able to take independent decisions. Um, and that comes on to funding and how businesses can ensure that where they're giving large chunks of money to the foundation, the foundation is going to use that money in a way that aligns with um, particular interests and charitable projects that, that the business is really engaged with. And the, and the way businesses will tend to do that is by giving that funding on terms. Now, those terms can specify sort of particular aims or focuses, but what doesn't work from a charity perspective is for the business to say, you're gonna make a grant of a thousand pounds to charity X, 6,000 pounds to charity Y, and 10,000 pounds to charity Z. And um, that level of sort of control will tend to lead to the, the charity being seen as a conduit for funding rather than it having discretion to take its own decisions. So there is a, there's a balance to strike with any funding arrangements between um, pointing the foundation in the direction that you want to see it go as a business um, and not, it, you know, not controlling it down to the very last penny. Um, and finally, knowing what to do when things go wrong. Now, Oh, I've gone, jumped ahead. It can be, quite often, it, it, when things go wrong, you know, what, what you, you're looking at is the constitution of the charity, that relationship between the charity and the foundation. You'll be looking at any contractual agreements, um, but also you'll be looking at the people involved, you know, what is the best way of, of, of resolving the, this tricky issue. Um, and normally it is a combination of those that can hopefully see um, a, a resolution. Um, but I think it is from the business's perspective, it, it is worth thinking about what control you do have and, and what powers that, that you can have over the, over the charity. And it is worth noting that charitable, ch charities are much more independent than commercial subsidiaries. Um, if you have any corporate relationship with a foundation at all, and there might be downsides of having a corporate um, a, a corporate relationship, um, but but charities can be hard to um, you tend to not be able to control a charity in the same way you can control a commercial subsidiary, um, and, and therefore that issue around independence and control it is important to look at that in some detail. Um, so just coming on to those initial steps, um, which I've mentioned, I mean, the first of it is just those really basic plans. What, what, what would you like that foundation to do? What's the best legal structure? Um, in terms of structure, we, we tend to recommend a, a, a structure that means the charity has, is, has a, is a legal person, which will either be a company limited by guarantee or a charitable incorporated organisation. And um, once you've got that initial structure set up and, and thought a little bit about how that relationship will work, um, the next step is preparing the governing document for the, um, for the foundation, setting out its charitable purposes, which might be to do anything that is charitable or can be more focused in on a particular area of interest for the business. Um, there'll be a number of ancillary documents that, can, that, that will need to 
go to the Charity Commission, which might include any business plans for the foundation and various policies, which might include a conflict of interest policy, a grant policy, safeguarding policies. Um, there's then a process of working up the application to the Charity Commission. And those applications tend to be sort of often 20 to 30 pages long these days. Um, with the Corporate Foundation, you can expect the Charity Commission to have quite a number of questions about the relationship between the business and the foundation. Um, once registration is achieved, you then have to apply to HMRC for recognition as a charity for tax purposes. Um, and then finally, there'll be a number of steps to get the charity um, operational and, and to get it up and running. So that's a fairly quick whiz through um, setting up a foundation. Um, does anybody have any questions? Ben's going to look at any questions in the chat box and, 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 and pose them. Thanks, Ben. So Ben's question was, I talked about a lack of alignment between a company and corporate foundation resulting in them parting ways. How might this come about? And what other problems have you seen down the line for clients with corporate foundations? So sadly, it is possible, um, and it happens quite frequently, that a degree of tension grows up between a charity, between a business, and its foundation. Um, so I, th I think I'll just tell you a little bit of a story in, in response to that. So um, the business I'm thinking of is a, is a large business with operations in a number of countries. It was set up about 40 years ago. Um, it's a very established business. It's actually been bought by a global conglomerate, um, but it's it, it's still operating as a separate identifiable business, and it has its own foundation, which was set up at the very, very beginning um, of its life 40 odd years ago. Um, the, the foundation has always been quite an important part of it. Part, um, it it's always, it, the foundation has always done quite a lot it's got its own staff. Um, it's, it's therefore quite separate from the running of the business. Um, and the business has already always made fairly large grants um, to the foundation. Um, now over time, there have been various changes within the business and the business um, started to want to see the foundation carry out its charitable work in a slightly different way to how it was doing. Not that it wants to, to move away from its primary area of focus, um, which was in a net particular area of education, but it, it, it became more interested in, in that funding being deployed in a, in a slightly different way, not to benefit the business, but, but just that the business thought it was a, um, that was the charitable giving it wanted to support rather than the charitable projects that the foundation was, was becoming increasing um, embroiled in and, um, and and the foundation over time wasn't wasn't willing to support or wasn't willing to refocus and support those projects that the business really wanted to fund and so the business ended up thinking well these are the you know we're not going to change our mind here we we want to support projects in this area and we're going to think about different ways of doing that so I think the first thing that went through their mind was, well, can we bring it back? Is there a way in which we can refocus the, um, the foundation on the types of projects we want to do? Have we, have we got that control? Can we do it? Um, and so going through the options there, it's, well, first off, you know, can we persuade them to take funding on, on terms that are going to require them to do that? And in this case, 
because the foundation had been around for a long time and have received um, you know, various chunks of money over the years, the foundation uh, essentially said, no, it, it didn't want to take the funding on those terms. Um, the business also thought about what other ways it could try and take control over the foundation. For example, could it, could it sack some of the trustees? Could it replace the board? Could it change the constitution of the, of the foundation to bring it back closer to, to actually that, that charitable work the, the business wanted to pursue? Um, and in this case, um, the foundation had been set up a, a long time ago and there was no, there, was, there were no rights um, written into the constitution of the business um, of the foundation um, that the um, business could exercise. So, for example, the business had no right to appoint trustees to the board. It had no right to remove trustees to the board. It was not a member of the of the charity. So, um, lots of charities are set up as companies limited by guarantee, and so they have members instead of shareholders. Um, but effectively, those members have the same right as a shareholder. And so while until um, it, it remains quite common for a business to be the sole member of the charity and there to be a corporate relationship between the two, um, but this doesn't give the business control in the same way it does for a commercial subsidiary. And actually we've had a recent judgment from the Supreme Court that says, the members of a charitable company and so the you know the business in, in in this structure will owe a duty to the charity to act in its own interests um, and while charity lawyers we are still working through this judgment and working out exactly what that means there are now quite big questions over whether that um over how a sole member such as a business in 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 a um as a sole member of a, of a foundation how how actually it can exercise control where it is in dispute with the board of, of, of the charity. So, so coming back to my example, in this case, because the charity had been set up a long time, the, the business didn't have any corporate rights. It wasn't a member. It had no rights to appoint or remove trustees. Um, and therefore, there was little it could do to, to force the foundation's hand. Um, what it did have was contractual control. So it had controls to, that allowed it to remove the rights of the foundation to use the business's name in its company name. It had rights to require it to stop using any use of its trademarks. Um, and so it had contractual controls that it had to rely on. Um, but, but sadly, what that meant was that it pulled the funding from the foundation. It pulled its use of the name and the brand. Um, and you've got this foundation there that, that effectively had no option to close down, and you've got the business over here, no longer with its foundation, having to decide whether it's going to set up a new project or whether it's going to pursue some other way of, of, you know, of, of carrying out, um, of, of funding the charitable projects that it had an interest in as a business. So that's, a, you know, that's one example, and obviously you know, there's a lot of time involved, there's a lot of upset involved, and um, you know, I think when attention is paid at the setup stage to make sure that control is right, to make sure that um, there is very good alignment between what the business wants and what you know, and and how the foundation is set up and how it's going to go about its work, um, it, it can help um, stop there being problems further down the line. Um, so the next question is. So for, for a business looking to establish a foundation, what would the usual timetable be to achieve this from initial discussions to creation? Um, it can vary hugely. Um, I would say ballpark timescale is six to nine months. And that would be uh, anticipating there would be a need for some discussion around structure and governance um, and a little bit of advice on mapping out that relationship between the business and the foundation. Um, it anticipates a time frame of four to five months in securing registration from the Charity Commission. So the time period for the Commission to register new charities has gone up and down a huge amount over the last two years. It got much quicker at the start of lockdown, um, but the Commission tell us that they're 
the number of applications they're getting for registration has crept back up to pre-pandemic levels and correspondingly the time frame for them to look at applications is, is going up again. Um, so uh, so it, it, it can take can take quite some time to, to do. So the next question I've got on the list is bearing in mind the need for the corporate foundation to be independent of the company, is it possible to maintain some form of oversight? I think the answer to that is absolutely yes. There tend to be three forms of controls we talk about when we, when we um, are talking to businesses about setting up foundations. The first of which is, is control through the charitable purpose of the foundation. So if you as a business know you want your foundation to focus in on a particular area, so for example, um, work preventing poverty in a particular geographic area, you can, you can have objects that are framed to limit the foundation's work to exactly that. Now, the downside of limiting the objects is the foundation then won't be able to do anything else. And changing objects is not always straightforward and, and can be time consuming and tends to require involvement of the Charity Commission. Um, but, it, but if you're very certain that you know exactly the, the, uh, the focus of the foundation and you think that's going to be there for the long term, control through the objects is, is one option. It, the second form of control is through, is, is through the constitution of the charity which might see the business having the right to appoint or remove trustees. It might give the business the right to veto changes to the constitution. Um, and although I, uh, there are question marks now over whether membership of a charitable um, company um, offers um, the kind of oversight that I think can be useful for a business, it, you know, it isn't as clear that that is another option. I mean, I think where you've got third party rights in the constitution of a charity, those, you know, there may be circumstances where those can be overridden by the members, so they might not be perfect control, but and they might also be powers that you as a business are expected to exercise in the charity's interests rather than your own. Um, but if you, you, know, you will have some discretion as to what is what you believe to be in the interests of the charity and where you genuinely believe the trust what the trustees are doing is you know is not right and they aren't following the right um direction um you know where you decide it's in in the charity's interests rather than the business's interest to remove that trustee um you know those powers can be can be deployed um, and the final form of control that you see is contractual controls and those controls can be imposed through the funding relationship, the funding, the charitable um, funding you provide being given on terms um, and requiring particular aims to be pursued. Um, you can also quite often see contracts in place that will govern um, in-kind services that the business might provide to the foundation. Um, and so there'll be a number of um, Oh, and the other contractual control that I've, I've mentioned a couple of times is, is that IP license and, and the brand agreement so that what the foundation is doing with your brand isn't anything that you'll be uncomfortable with and also giving you the right to, you know, pull the, pull the brand if, you know, there is a reputational issue that, that is troubling. I've got another question in there that says, can the company choose anything as the objects of the foundation? <coughs> That's a good question. We haven't spoken much about, about preparing objects of a charity. So what is charitable has been set out in the law, in charity law, as it's developed over hundreds and hundreds of years. And with the first description of charitable purposes, I think being in the Statute of Elizabeth in 1601, so uh, the law has come on slightly from there and what we now have in, in the charity, in the, in the main piece of charity legislation is descriptions of charitable purposes. Um, and, and those descriptions include things such as advancement, 
religion, prevention or relief of poverty, advancement of education, um, uh, supporting community purposes, um, and, and there are 13 in total, advancement of amateur sport. Um, but within each of those descriptions, case law that's been developed over the years has um, has framed what is charitable within those descriptions in a particular way. And so something might be educational, but it might not be um, it might not be capable of, of a charity of it being a charitable activity necessarily unless it meets um, unless it falls within what charity law has said you know is the advancement of education for the public benefit um, so uh, but within those descriptions of purposes um, foundations might might choose um, two or three of those descriptions they might decide that they're very into advancing education and supporting community sport or they might decide that actually they're focusing in on um, developing community facilities or community capacity in a, in a particular way that is charitable um, it is fairly common for um, corporate foundations to have general what are known as general charitable purposes and what that means is that the foundation can support any any activity just so long as it is charitable um, and that will mean that the foundation, it, it might still have a focus on a particular area. It might still decide that actually what it, what it's going to do with most of its money, is going to be to you know, work with a, uh, a homeless charity, say, or uh, another kind of charity. But but it also has the option if it wants to make other donations. And I think that can be useful, particularly where the foundation might match fund fundraising by employees. Um, because it will mean that whatever the, the employee is fundraising for, the foundation then has the flexibility to also make a gift. Um, it, you know, it, 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 and, and so you, you do have a, with general charitable purposes, you aren't confined to, to being limited in a particular area, but obviously then the foundation you know, doesn't have any limits on what it can do and it, it can go off in a, in a completely different direction, subject to any uh, restrictions you've imposed on it in, in, in any funding agreement. Does anyone have any more questions? I think then we've probably got time for an, uh, a last one if, if there is another question. So one last question. So why is it a good idea to set up a foundation as a charity rather than a not-for-profit company or some other kind of entity? So this is it's an interesting question because there are other types of not-for-profit companies that are not charities. Um, so let's talk about the foundation as a charity first off. So Charities are highly regulated. They are limited to what they can do and their activities are limited as well. Um, so there are a lot of restrictions on charities. They are, um, but they also benefit from very significant um, tax reliefs. Um, charities don't tend to pay any um, direct taxes other than in very limited circumstances. Um, and a, a, business, a payment by business to a registered charity um, will will be deductible from any calculation of corporation tax. And so there's a very sort of clear structure set up there for gifts by businesses and also where an individual is given to a charity, um, the charity can also claim gift aid and the in individual can also claim a gift aid reclaim if they are a higher rate taxpayer. So for, from a tax perspective, it can be easier to um, where that foundation is a charity um, because it is it is it tends to be more straightforward for the business to give to a charity than for the business to give to other types of not-for-profit won't necessarily be the case there, you know there will be things to think about if, if you do want to give to other not-for-profits but giving to a charity is, is pretty straightforward um, the advantage for the foundation of being a charity is that it, it has got this recognizable well-known well understood status it has a charity number 
and therefore when it comes to dealing with other charities when it comes to providing support um, the fact that it, it does operate it is highly regulated itself there's a public register you can check um, will mean that other charities will be very happy to deal with it they'll be very familiar with its status now sometimes what people want their foundation to do doesn't quite fit neatly into that charitable box and in some cases there we we think about whether or not that foundation could be set up as a community interest company or as a other other as a company limited by guarantee with not-for-profit objects now in both those cases there will be a, a, a company limited by guarantee that just that is that has not-for-profit objects and a community interest company they are not treated in any different way for tax purposes and so they will um, be liable to pay corporation tax on any um, you know, on, on any profits um, and the deductions from corporation tax from um, payments by business to other forms of not-for-profit um, you know, it isn't a gift a payment so you have to think from a corporate tax perspective um, you know the basis on which that 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 payment is being made to the other type of not-for-profit. Um, I, I think the other the other downside is, is that you that lack of recognition of, of the special status of charity. Um, but uh, but where actually you you know the business really wants a not-for-profit working alongside it that's going to do something particular that doesn't fit neatly within to the charity box. Um, yeah. There might be advantages in in having a not-for-profit entity that isn't a charity because then it would, can operate without that same level of regulation um it, it can go about its work and it, you know it can describe itself as a not-for-profit it can probably use the word foundation if it meets particular um requirements set out by a company's house um and, and so it, it it, it is an alternative and it might be able to do more trading activity than other charities so i think while for most charitable status will, is, is, will usually be preferable um it won't universally be the case and there might be circumstances where another type of not-for-profit might be worth thinking about so i think that that was the last um question that i had um i hope you found today useful if i have if you do have any questions subsequently, if I've missed anything, please do get in touch. Very happy to, to drop your line. Um, it'd be great to hear from um, people who are um, listening um, at home today. So thank you very much for joining us. And I hope um, some of you can join the events, other events going on later on today. So thank you.